Marx, Women, and Capitalist Social Reproduction by Martha E. Jimenez, which I am probably pronouncing incorrectly. Uh, this is, is a book, so this is the introduction. This collection of essays is a contribution to the literature on the relationship between Marxism and feminism and the significance of Marxist theory for the understanding of current processes of economic, political, and social change. It is intended to illustrate the relevance of historical materialism for the study of some important academic and political questions, the oppression of women, social reproduction, identity politics, the relationship between paid and unpaid work, and the key and often unacknowledged importance of class for deepening our knowledge of these and other aspects of capitalist social formations. More importantly, these essays show, in different contexts, my contribution to the development of Marxist feminist theory, and in retrospect, to capitalist social reproduction theory. My approach to theorizing about the topics listed above is informed by my professional training as a sociologist, my theoretical and political commi commitments to Marxism and feminism, and my uh, biography. Though I was born and grew up in Argentina, I have lived in the United States for more than half of my adult life. My yearly trips to Argentina to visit my parents kept alive the experiential knowledge of a different, of a very different social and political context, thus enriching the outlook I bring to my work. In the late 1950s, I studied law at the University of Cordoba in Cordoba, Argentina. With the support of a scholarship from the Institute of International Education, I studied for two years at Montana State University in Musula, Montana, where in 1962 I received a BA in Political Science and History. After my return to Argentina, I switched from law to sociology and joined the first cohort of students admitted to a new master's level program that opened at the brand new Institute of Sociology at the University of Cordoba. The program offered standard American sociology with large doses of Max Weber, who was the program director's favorite theoretician. He considered Marx's work unworthy of consideration because of Marx's alleged economic determ determinism and class reductionism. Some of my more knowledgeable fellow students questioned the director's exclusion of Marx's work and Marxist literature from our assigned readings, pointing out flaws and absences in the sociology we were taught. Soon enough, even those of us, including myself, who had never read that literature, had to question a social science that excluded or minimized the aspects of Argentine and Latin American social reality which were familiar to us, part of our history, culture, and experience. For us, classes, class struggles, class interests, oligarchy, exploitation, imperialism, colonialism, and revolution were not just sociological categories of debatable social science validity and relevance, but ordinary concepts, elements of ordinary political discourse, and of a common sense understanding of social reality. Having lived through the 1955 revolution that ousted Argentina's president, General Perón, and being accustomed to the presence of our lives of military mobilizations and coups, the students and workers' political activism and general strikes, we found the view of society American sociology offered, a perspective that stressed order and consensus, unrealistic and incomplete. After I finished the sociology program in Cor Cordoba, I returned to the United States, where in the late 1960s, I entered the graduate program in sociology at UCLA and discovered Marx and Marxism in a seminar on classical sociological theory. Reading Marx was an entirely new experience. His work was dense, complex, and utterly compelling because it illuminated the role of capitalism in the history of Latin America and the foundations of contemporary social reality in ways that offered a deeper understanding of the more obvious, superficial aspects that sociologists limited themselves to studying. 
His work, as well as the work of Marxist scholars, negated the economic determinism and other misleading labels used to dismiss such work in the average textbook. In graduate school, I also became acquainted with the women's movement and the emergent critical thinking about women's place in society. One of the first formulations of this issue, women as a minority group, puzzled me, as women were numerically the majority. Until I read the comparison between the way members of racial minorities and women were treated. An important slogan of the movement was sisterhood is powerful, which, given my awareness of class differences among women, I considered unrealistic and misleading. I also found it very difficult to understand the notion prevalent in the emergent feminist literature that, were, that women were oppressed as women. However, as I read feminist manifestos, essays, and the fledgling feminist social science literature, it became increasingly clear to me that the US, supposedly the most developed country in the world, was rather backward with respect to women. I grew up in a context where I took for granted women's participation in politics and what in the US were considered at the time male professions such as medicine, dentistry, engineering, and law. It would have never occurred to me to refer to a professional woman using her gender as a qualifier, e.g. as a woman dentist. I myself had studied law. It was not an unusual, unusual career choice among Argentine middle-class women in the late 1950s, but my goal at the time was to be a lawyer, not a woman lawyer. Nevertheless, leaving aside the issue of women's educational and occupational opportunities in the U.S., the feminist idea that women could be oppressed as women remained puzzling. From my perspective, being male or female was only one aspect of a person's being in the world, and far less important than social class and social status. The key sources of individuals' cultural, cultural and economic resources. It took some time until I learned that in the U.S. women faced discrimination in the workplace, unequal pay, and social stereotypes about their intelligence and capabilities that affected their occupational and educational opportunities. I finally understood what the women's movement was about and why women organized themselves as women. However, having grown up in a context where, unlike in the US, class was the dominant social identifier and remained critical of feminist thinking that ignored or minimized class and other divisions among women. Also, in graduate school, I learned about the struggles of Mexican-Americans and about the differences between Mexican-American students and foreign students from Latin America, like myself. A Mexican-American student reacted negatively to the possibility that I might participate in a research project as a Spanish-speaking interviewer. I was understandably upset because I naively because I naively believed that among Spanish-speaking people, differences of national origin did not matter. Discussing this situation with other graduate students, I came to realize how ignorant I was about U.S. racial and ethnic relations, about the oppression of, of Black people, Mexican-Americans, and other non-white populations about the meaning of minority status. These brief reflections about my encounter with the women's movement and with the racial and ethnic divisions in the U.S. may seem small, unimportant observations, typical of the experience of foreign students as they struggle to decipher their new environment. In retrospect, however, as can be seen throughout my work, they were a source of important insights and most helpful in my intellectual development and scholarly work. My reading of Marx and Marxist scholarship in graduate school and beyond was, as I now realize, rather idiosyncratic and intended to help me identify the elements of historical materialism suitable for the study of specific topics. I was particularly interested in learning how to transcend what I understood to be the limits of mainstream sociological and feminist theory and research by bringing in the theoretical and methodological insights I could glean from reading Marx, Engels, and the Marxist scholars I discovered while in graduate school, including Althusser, Godelier, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School. At the same time, I did not fully discard feminist and social science theories and research findings. Rather, in line with Marx's observation that science would be superfluous if the outward appearance and the essence of things 
directly coincided. I looked upon them as sources of insights and knowledge about the outward appearance of social reality. Following Godelier's reformulation, a structure is part of social reality, but not of visible relationships. I sought in Marx's work and the work of Marxist scholars, the theoretical and methodological tools useful for identifying the elements of the capitalist mode of production underlying the sphere of appearance and visible relationships. The premise underlying the approach I eventually developed to theorizing and research was that the contributions to knowledge from historical materialism and the social sciences could be critically and fruitfully integrated because the social sciences yielded useful, albeit incomplete, knowledge about social phenomena. The social sciences studying capitalist societies have each chosen as their subject an aspect of social reality, e.g. the state, society, the economy, or culture, leaving outside their purview the key historical phenomenon that underlies it and gives it meaning in context as part of a historical totality, namely the capitalist mode of production. The social sciences thus sever the connections between capitalism and their object of study. By ignoring the links between capitalism and social phenomena, the social sciences universalize the historical causes of social phenomena and reify them into natural laws, functional prerequisites, and or the result of human nature. In contrast, historical materialism is the science of the capitalist mode of production as a whole, of the relationship between the level of the production of commodities, its structure, relations, and contradictions, and their corresponding ideological and political integument. It is also the science of social formations, the historically specific contexts within which the mode of production operates. It is by using the theoretical and methodological tools of historical materialism that it is possible to establish the historically specific foundations or conditions of possibility of the social phenomena studied by the social sciences. I applied the same criteria to feminist theories and research because to the extent they rejected Marx and Marxist scholarship and postulated systems of patriarchal or unequal relations between men and women independent from though interacting with modes of production, they did not fully grasp the historically specific determinants of women's lives. My reading of Marx, Engels, and Marxist scholars was not primarily aimed at finding everything they might have written about a specific topic, such as women, the family, or population, for example. Learning from them and finding appropriate citations was only an aspect of the reading process. And while aware that some of Marx's and Engels's views might be considered objectionable in the context of contemporary sensibilities, I did not think that such views detracted from the importance of their work, nor were these sufficient grounds to discard their work as the product of dead white European males. I focused primarily on theory and methodology, on learning how to think about the topics that matter to me through the lens of Marx's and Engels's theories and methodological insights as articulated in their work and as further developed and explained in the secondary literature. Whether or not I succeeded in my intellectual project is something readers must decide. The chapters included in this volume were published between 1975 and 2009. Political commitment is perhaps more evident in the articles published in the 1970s, written at a time when I was politically active and in the process of developing my intellectual skills and theoretical allegiances through lively debate with colleagues and friends. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, I participated in the sociology, soci sociology liberation movement within the American Sociological Association and the Radical Caucus that followed it. To be part of this movement, which in 1975 led to the creation of the ASA section on Marxist sociology, was very important for my intellectual development. It gave legitimacy to my work in a community of peers that compensated for my relative intellectual isolation at my place of work. Invited by several undergraduates, I joined the students and faculty who worked together and eventually succeeded in the creation of a women's studies program at the University of Colorado, where I taught at the Department of Sociology between 1973 and 2007. During my first years at the University of Colorado, 
I belonged to an interdisciplinary faculty Marxist reading and discussion group that lasted until the, the late 1970s. Feminist theories have changed throughout the years. At the time I became a feminist and started to write and teach about feminist issues, it was taken for granted that women were oppressed as women. As Gunnarsson asks, is it not the very point of departure of feminist theorizing that women are oppressed, exploited, discriminated, excluded by virtue of their being women? While the affirmative answer to this question would seem obvious, such a reply would not be unanimously accepted today because the, stigmatizi the stigmatization of the category women has become such a taken for granted element in feminist discussions. Readers should know then that throughout this volume, I have continued to use the categories women and men because at the level of analysis at which I use them, they denote structural positions within the gender structure and underlying gender relations. The categories women and men do not assume an essential identity common to everyone, nor common experiences that ignore the complex locations of people in the various social structures and power relations that shape their lives. At the level of analysis of concrete individuals, it is impossible for them and for observers to partition their experiences and sense of self into gender, race, ethnicity, national origin, and other dimensions. At the same time, the structures of race, gender, and class have distinct, distinct existences insofar as they exercise their casual force on people's lives in ways relatively independent from each other which I add may or may not influence how individuals identify themselves. Most of my work is about feminist theory and feminist politics without some sense in which woman is in the name of a social collective. There is nothing specific about feminist politics though. As the years went by, I came to the conclusion that feminist politics cannot be separate from class politics. Once politics become more obvious when writing in the context of political engagement, and theoretical debate, but scholarly social science writing is always political. Under the veneer of objectivity, there is always a dialogue with those whose work academics approve and disapprove of. Plus, one can find telling omissions, silences, and euphemisms. To acknowledge the political dimension of one's work, however, does not necessarily make the work tendentious or misleading. Just as the pursuit of scientific objectivity does not eliminate the political implications inherent in social science scholarly work. Therefore, as I show how I appropriated elements of historical materialism in the process of criticizing feminist and social science theories and developing theoretical alternatives, I will also describe the political and personal context which led me to become interested in the topics examined in this volume. Marxist Feminist Theory. The first two chapters in this section were written between the mid and late 1970s, when I was involved in a feminist consciousness raising group and in the women's studies program. As I worked to build a Marxist theoretical alternative to the liberal, radical, and socialist feminist perspectives emerging at the time, I combined my reading of Marx, Engels, Althusser, and Godelier to develop what, at first, I called a structuralist Marxist theoretical perspective, the basis for my version of Marxist feminist theory. Most of the colleagues, students, and friends with whom I exchanged ideas about feminism adhered to views that could be broadly categorized as liberal feminism, i.e. they assumed that there was a civil rights solution to the problems affecting women, or radical feminism i.e. they assumed that the source of women's problems was patriarchy. Socialist feminism, which combined a critique of capitalism with a critique of patriarchy, did not yet have followers among the feminists I knew at the time. Feminists shared similar concerns for the manifold problems affecting women's lives in the United States, but disagreed about their causes and potential solutions. Women interested both in feminism and Marxism were rare in the small city where I worked and lived, but abundant on the east and west coasts of the United States. In New York, they formed study groups focused on the study and criticism of Marx's and Engels's work, as they evaluated their potential relevance for feminist theory and research. In time, they produced conference papers, journals, books, a prolific and 
and important literature shaped by their professional training as sociolo sociologists, economists, historians, or anthropologists, and by their interpretations and criticisms of Marx's and Engels's works. In contrast to this milieu, I worked alone, outside the main feminist social and intellectual networks, developing my ideas through lively debates in the context of the Women's Studies Advisory Board and fruitful discussions with some graduate students, but mostly through critical engagement with the dominant feminist literature. My work was not published in the main feminist journals or cited in the 1980s feminist literature. Though disappointing at the time, this lack of recognition is not, in retrospect, unsurprising. My work was critical of the dominant views in feminist theory and offered a theoretical alternative outside the mainstream. The first two chapters are interrelated. Chapter one, Marxism and Fem Feminism, presents an overview of the place of women within capitalism and an examination of the scientific and political importance of Marxism for feminism. Chapter two, Structuralist Marxism on the Oppression of Women, makes explicit the principles of structuralist Marxism underlying the previous chapter and discusses in some detail the mode of capitalist reproduction and its effects on sexual inequality. It offers a theoretical introduction to structuralist Marxism and offers a critique of feminist theories of the 1970s followed by the application of structuralist Marxism to the elucidation of the capitalist determinants of sexual inequality. These two chapters show how I proceeded to develop a Marxist feminist theoretical approach to sexual inequality, eschewing theories of patriarchy and other abstract ahistorical explanations. According to the premises of historical materialism, the biology of sexuality, human procreation, and physical reproduction is a trans-historical material condition of all modes of production. The social organization of the production of the necessities of life presupposes the social organization of the production and reproduction of human beings, e.g. kinship networks, and the production and reproduction of social relations and forms of consciousness. The production of things to satisfy needs, the development of new needs, and the production and reproduction of human beings and social institutions and relations are not to be interpreted as different historical stages. Dialectically, they are aspects or moments of complex processes which function simultaneously today as they did at the dawn of human history. According to Marx and Engels, the production of life, of one's own life and labor, and of another in procreation now appears as a double relationship, on the one hand as a natural relationship, on the, on the other as a social one. The activities necessary to sustain human life are natural in that they stem from the very physical and biological requirements of the human species. And at the same time, they are social because they entail cooperation among the producers of things, as well as the producers and reproducers of life. Just as there are historical modes of production, so I argue there are historical modes of producing human beings. Every mode of production implies a mode of sexual reproduction. But just as the material necessity to produce the means of production and subsistence does not determine the historically specific social relations in which they are produced, the biology of procreation does not determine the mode of reproduction, i.e. social relations in which children are born and raised, although it imposes limits on their variations. This statement would seem to be easily contradicted by the apparently timeless and universal nuclear family unit of parents and children. Murdoch, for example, argued that the nuclear family, family is universal because it fulfills four functions essential for the survival of human societies. Sexual relations, procreation, socialization, and economic cooperation. At the level of observable social relations, this family form is prevalent in capitalist societies. It is not, however, universal because those functions can be fulfilled within a variety of social arrangements. Given that women are responsible for child care and most of the household labor, it would seem obvious that the source of women's oppression is to be found in their biological role in reproduction and in the ensuing sexual division of labor and domestic activities, which curtail their educational and occupational opportunities. 
I agree that women's role in procreation and household labor contribute to the strengthening of social inequality. However, framing the issue in abstract and universal terms, as if the limits nature imposes on social relations determines the historical specificity of those relations, exonerates the capitalist mode of production from its role in producing and reproducing male dominance. To examine this issue historically in the context of the capitalist mode of production, one must identify the capitalist processes that place men and women in unequal relationships, i.e. the relationship between the capitalist mode of production and reproduction. Men and women, however, are abstractions, for people are an ensemble of social relations and the key relations determining people's options and often their fate under capitalism are class relations. The prevalence and apparent sameness of the nuclear family hides the qualitative differences between working class and capitalist families, the different social relations of reproduction within the working class, and consequently, the differences in the sources of male power and in the forms or kinds of oppressions shaping the lives of capitalist and working class women. The family is a useful concept, and I use it descriptively in my work. It is, however, ideologically charged with expectations about what families and family roles should and should not be. On the basis of Althusser's analysis of the mode of production and its elements, I constructed a theoretical concept, mode of sexual reproduction, which I eventually modified, expanded, and called mode of physical and social reproduction though generally I refer to it in abbreviated form as mode of reproduction. Readers might wonder whether it is necessary to replace a known concept, family, with the elaborate notion of mode of reproduction. The concept mode of reproduction calls attention to the material conditions, economic and biological, that shape activities and mediate relations within the family which are glossed over by the dominant ideologies about marriage and family roles. Like the mode of production, the mode of reproduction is constituted by the combination of its elements. Means of biological, physical, and social reproduction, labor, and objects of labor, in the context of relations between the agents of reproduction mediated by the relationship to those elements. For example, in households where men are the only breadwinner winners and women are full-time domestic workers, the stereotypical nuclear family the relationship is mediated, shaped by their different relationship to the means of exchange, which men tend to control and is the basis for their power, exceptions notwithstanding. Men and women own part of the biological means of reproduction and sexual relations eventually result in procreation. Unlike family, a concept that presupposes marriage and heterosexuality as its normal form and tacitly relegates single parent, gay and lesbian families and other arrangements to deviant or exceptional status, mode of reproduction is the concept that calls attention to the biological, political and economic basis of its contradictory relations and allows for the exploration of the relations of reproduction among other kinds of agents, e.g. cohabiting couples, couples and hired domestic workers, foster parents, orphanages, workers' hostels, etc., in different contexts, within different classes and social strata. In the context of the capitalist mode of production, the functioning of the mode of production determines the mode of reproduction. The premises of my argument are the following. Family formation and stability in the working class depends on the employment of at least one of its adult members. The interaction between sex dif differentiation and sex stratification results in women's overrepresentation in low paid, low skilled jobs. Competition for scarce jobs in a context that rules out full employment at a living wage for all male and female workers turns family formation for working class women into an alternative to employment in the public sector, thus placing them in a subordinate position dependent on a gainfully employed husband or partner and reinforcing working class women's subordinate place in the occupational structure and inside the home. This, I argue, is the material basis for the oppression of working class women. 
given that the vast majority of the population in capitalist social formations is propertyless, depending on wages or salaries for economic survival. The observable manifestations of the oppression of working class or propertyless women appear as the oppression of women in general. The capitalist processes that place working class women in are working class men and women in unequal economic locations within the occupational structure and unequal relationships inside and outside the household are the processes of capital accumulation that continuously revolutionize the forces of production and the locations of investments, thus continuously changing the quantity, quality and location of the demand for labor and therefore continuously changing the size and composition of the employed layers of the labor force as well as the size and composition of the reserve army of labor. In this situation of permanent job scarcity and relentless competition and change, the family becomes a site of oppression as well as a, as a survival strategy for the working class, particularly for working class women. While the inequality between men and women precedes capitalism, what matters is not its chronological origins, but its organic connections or ideal genesis within capitalism. Established in the relationship between the capitalist modes of production and reproduction and observable in its effects, the division between the public production of commodities and the private reproduction of laborers and labor power. I give causal weight as the material basis of the oppression of working class women under capitalism to the effects of the struggle for survival into which capital's pursuit of profits at any cost forces the working class. I argue, I argue that because capitalism produces and reproduces unemployment and insecurity in a context of universalized commodity production, where working class consumption depends on the prior sale of labor power, the family form of the mode of reproduction emerges as an alternative source of economic survival for working class people. Women's unpaid domestic labor stretches wages and salaries thus enhancing the quality of life for the men whose earnings support them and ensuring their own and their children's well-being in the process. But this alternative has a price, economic and social inequality outside the home and economic dependence and oppression within the home. Chapter three, Marxism and class, gender and race, rethinking the trilogy is a critique of the race, gender, and class mantra that emerged as a critique of feminism's, feminism, <laughs> feminism's political subject, which generalized from the experience of white, mainly middle-class women, and as an alternative to Marxism's alleged class determinism. The trilogy minimizes the importance of class insofar as it reduces it to classism, i.e. another form of oppression equal in its significance to race and gender, or to class in the social stratification sense, i.e. socioeconomic status. From the standpoint of trilogy supporters, everyone has a class, gender, and racial identity because everyone is located at the intersection of those structures. That presupposes the same kind of determinism or reductionism attributed to Marxism with respect to class. But if race and gender reductionisms are rejected, then individuals' identities cannot be taken for granted in any instance, except when an identity is attributed to them by an observer. This attribution of identity is particularly important when the observer is someone in a position of power, e.g. the police, doctors, teachers, employers. The a-theoretical nature of the trilogy is thus exposed. It is a set of two categories. Three, if class is included in the sociological descriptive sense, which can be used to classify people, but these are floating categories with no theoretical context identifying the system or structure within which they may make sense. This is why the efforts to connect class, gender, and race through a, pl uh, through a plethora of metaphors, intersectionality, interconnection, interplay, for example, are unsuccessful. As the trilogy is supposed to identify the intersection of three systems of oppression thus entailing power relations, while at the same time class is considered no more casual or no more causally significant than gender and race, an abstract notion of power relations is, is invoked as the more basic structure of inequality underlying the trilogy. 
I have argued that the abstract structure of power and privilege that is invoked to account for the effects of oppression and exploitation is no other than the unmentionable capitalist class structure and relations. Unmentionable, unmentionable because the limits of political discourse allow the expression of grievances, particularly work-related grievances, only or primarily through the lens of identity politics. In chapter four, Reflections on Intersectionality, I argue that the same criticisms presented in the previous chapter apply to the expanded trilogy, i.e. intersectionality. Other axes of oppression, e.g. age, disability, citizenship status, ethnicity, sexual preference, were eventually added to the original three, and intersectionality, one of the metaphors used to connect them, eventually became the dominant perspective within feminist theory. I examine in this chapter, chapter intersectionality's theoretical shortcomings, its ambiguous scope. Does it apply only to women or to men also? Does everyone have a complex identity or only the disadvantaged? Is it a feminist perspective or a perspective on social inequality and its problematic relationship to identity politics? In chapter five, what's material about materialist feminism, a Marxist feminist critique, I seek to ascertain the meaning of materialist feminism, a trend in feminist thought I initially misinterpreted as a return of Marxist feminism. I discovered that there is a materialist feminism open to consider all sorts of things as material, such as discourse, the body, ideology, culture, and language, while rejecting as economism the material materiality of the mode of production. However, closest to Marxist feminism is the materialist feminism theorized by Hennessy and Hennessy and Ingraham, a subtle blend of Marxism, structuralism, feminism, and postmodern theory of the subject that does not avoid acknowledging the importance of historical materialism as a source of emancipatory knowledge and the need to relate the discursive to the materiality of the non-discursive, the globalized mode of production or global analytic in Hennessy's terms. The coexistence of these two very different kinds of feminist theories under the same label, materialist feminism, is bound to be confusing and obscures the need for a return to Marxist feminism, as the effects of global capitalism on working women intensify the latter's exploitation and oppression. Capitalist Social Reproduction in this section, I brought together chapters in which reproduction, biological, physical, social, daily, and generational, figure more prominently than in others. Social reproduction is a complex concept which, in contemporary societies, involves market-level relationships among various institutions, e.g. the family, the state, educational institutions, healthcare systems, elder care, child care, which together with the input of domestic labor enter into the processes of maintaining and reproducing on a daily and generational basis, labor power and the laboring population. However, most of this vol volume can be viewed as a contribution to capitalist social reproduction. Abstractly considered, so social reproduction is a functional requirement in all societies. It is about the social relations and institutions surrounding the reproduction of the population and the social groups, classes, strata within classes, and any other divisions characterizing the population in a given society. Capitalist social reproduction involves similar phenomena, but posits that under capitalist conditions, reproduction takes place under historically specific conditions in which production determines reproduction. I became interested in this area of population studies while studying demographic methods. At the time, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, overpopulation in the third world, population control, and family planning seemed to be the primary concern of public and private funding agencies and the main focus of demographic research. Ehrlich's The Population Bomb had recently been published with extraordinary academic and public success. Most social scientists, journalists, and the average person believed that excessive population growth was the major threat facing the world, that third world poverty 
social, and environmental problems and underdevelopment were largely caused by overpopulation, and that population control would benefit poor nations as much as the use of birth control would benefit the poor everywhere. Those Malthusian and Neo-Malthusian beliefs were taken for granted at that time as unquestionable truths. The literature about Latin America's poverty and underdevelopment emphasized cultural determinants of high fertility, e.g. Catholic values against abortion and birth control and men's need to prove their masculinity by fathering many children. Such cultural explanations ignored the effects of the capitalist exploitation of people and natural resources upon the relations between the sexes, family formation, access to education, health care, and so on. It was this critical stance that led me to consider the possibility of developing a Marxist theoretical analysis of the determinants of population phenomena. My main thesis advisor was a demo demographer, not a Marxist scholar. Nevertheless, he, listed, he listened sympathetically to my critiques of Malthusian and Neo-Malthusian explanations of poverty and underdevelopment, and to my surprise, encouraged me to explore the usefulness of Marxist theory for the study of population. I wrote an essay comparing Marx's and Malthus's principles of population, and eventually a theoretical dissertation in which I presented a critique of the theories about fertility, migration and mortality dominant at the time in population studies and developed the concept capitalist mode of sexual reproduction, examining its superstructural and structural basis and its contribution to the oppression of women. I also developed a Marxist theoretical framework for the study of population, the basis for chapter six, population and capitalism. The core of the theoretical framework is the law of capital accumulation, which affects fertility, mortality, and migration through changes in the demand for labor, quantitative and qualitative, which in turn, after the social and economic context within which people make decisions and engage in behaviors ultimately affecting macro demographic processes. Changes in capital accumulation in turn are never purely economic. They take place in the context of capitalist social formations and are affected by their historically specific characteristics, e.g. political, legal, and ideological structures and processes. Figure one is an attempt to depict the framework in a way that unavoidably simplifies a very complex and dialectical network of relationships. Economists and demo demographers use the demand for labor as an independent variable to predict short and long-term changes in fertility and the labor supply. The framework I developed is intended to identify the capitalist historical and political context underlying changes in the demand for labor. It is not intended to predict specific outcomes such as changes in fertility rates reflected in time in changes in the supply of some types of labor but rather aims to make explicit the socio-economic and political context within which men and women work, live and act in ways, oops, in ways largely, oops. Oh my God, I lost my place. Um, in ways largely determined by their class location and place in the socioeconomic stratification within classes, which in turn influences access to their conditions of reproduction, resulting in changes affecting family formation, family size, migration, and so on. The theoretical framework outlines some of the links between production and reproduction. It can be read as a roadmap intended to make explicit some of the complex processes that open up and close down possibilities for the working classes, who are the majority of the population in capitalist social formations, and whose ability to have access to their conditions of reproduction is affected by processes that sustain or undermine communities, that create imbalances in the age and sex composition of the working population, thereby affecting marriage and family formation, that compel some to migrate within or across national boundaries, and so on. The framework sheds light on the many variables through which the changing social and economic terrain within which the working class classes struggle 
for economic survival affect their bodies, their ability to reproduce, their health, life expectancy, opportunities, the relations between the men and women, and the extent to which they can build lives rooted in one place or find themselves compelled to uproot themselves in search of employment. Underlying the market level relationships among the very variety of institutions, e.g. households, the market, the state, educational institutions, healthcare systems, and so on, which together with the input of domestic labor, enter into the processes of maintaining and reproducing labor power in the laboring population. There's the complex network of processes flowing from changes in capital accumulation within the historically specific conditions characterizing different capitalist social formations. The full understanding of the determinants of the social reproduction of the social classes, the working class in particular, and the reproduction of the environmental conditions of production and reproduction needs to bring together these levels of analysis, mode of production and social formations. In Chapter 7, Feminism, Pronatalism, and Motherhood, I examine Blake's argument for the importance of demographically relevant determinants of sexual inequality, i.e. pronatalist institutional and ideological pressures toward compulsory parenthood, making parental roles indispensable for the fulfillment of masculinity and femininity. In Blake's view, pressures supporting parental roles rather than male supremacy are the source of the problems women face when making educational and occupational choices in conflict with family demands. Blake also argued, and this is what caught my attention and prompted me to write this chapter, that the women's liberation movement in, su in supporting only or primarily women's rights to do both, i.e. to have families and to work, including having a career, at the same time supported the pronatalist policy ingrained in dominant sexual expectations. With the exception of Firestone, who was exceedingly critical of compulsory motherhood, my examination of the literature showed that Blake was correct. Women's option not to procreate was not mentioned in the discussion of reproductive rights. The 1960s and the 1970s were years of important struggles for women's and gay rights which emerged at a time when most people in the U.S. lived under very strict social controls over sexuality. Homosexuality was shunned, and single people, particularly men, were under suspicion so that many bought respectability through heterosexual marriage. Eventually, did I say hetero heterosexual marriage? Heterosexual marriage. Eventually, not only heterosexuals, especially women, but also gays and lesbians rebelled against those ideological constraints. Today, those constraints have been weakened and no longer sing signify for a substantial proportion of the population. Today, there are more women with professional and business careers than 50 years ago. The marriage rate has fallen drastically, while cohabitation is now more socially acceptable. Gays and lesbians live more openly and many claim the right to marry and have children. This right, already granted in several states at the time I wrote the first draft of this introduction, has become the law of the land because of a landmark Supreme Court decision. Despite these changes, struggles for sexual and reproductive freedom and women's struggles for equal opportunities continue. Ideologies supporting sexual inequality have fewer vocal adherents today than 50 years ago, but have not been entirely undermined. In the U.S., pronatalist ideologies and policies supporting parenthood for all continue ensconced in right-wing battles and policies against legalized abortion, broad availability of contra um, contraception for women, and gay and lesbian marriage um, and adoptions. Right-wing policies ostensibly designed to protect marriage defined as the union of a man and a woman the integrity of the family and life itself have the effect of narrowing women's reproductive choices and the direction they would like their life to take. And that gay, lesbian, and heterosexual couples and individuals seek to have children through adoption or with the use of reproductive technologies attests to the strength and persistence of prescriptive parenthood despite fertility problems, marital status, and sexual orientation. To be critical of pronatalism is not equivalent to condemning parenthood. It is to shed light on its prescriptive nature 
and proposed that it would be socially and ecologically desirable that parenthood cease to be considered as a natural instinct and or a religious or social duty. The biological clock that some women claim to hear ticking is also a social clock, reminding them that whatever else may be going on in their lives, motherhood is their destiny, the road to a social acceptance and integration. It is because parenthood is not a natural instinct, but socially and prescriptively imposed, that many people unsuited for family formation bear or adopt children. Domestic violence and child abuse result from the often deadly interaction between sexual inequality and pronatalism. Today, pronatalist ideologies and social pressures continue to curtail women's opportunities and ability to shape their future and place them in a disadvantaged position relative to men, thus sustaining the inequality between men and women despite considerable gains in sexual liberation, civil rights, and economic opportunities for women. In Chapter 8, Reproduction and Procreation Under Capitalism, a Marxist Feminist Analysis, I present different feminists' views about reproductive technologies and explore the impact of these technologies on women and on the mode of reproduction. I argue that these technologies, as they fragment the biological process of reproduction, separating sexuality from procreation, and creating the material conditions for the emergence of a market in eggs, sperm, and wombs, have become the basis for the structural and functional differentiation of the mode of reproduction into a mode of social reproduction and a mode of procreation. In the context of the mode of social reproduction, individuals or couples raise children who may or may not be genetically related to both or one of them. Within the mode of procreation, individuals or couples buy eggs and or sperm and lease or rent a woman's womb in order to obtain a child or children who may or may not be gen genetically related to them. Furthermore, the globalization of the market in the elements of biological reproduction is contributing to the oppression of women in both wealthy and less developed countries. The rise of the mode of procreation has opened up another terrain where working class and poor women are oppressed, and it has deepened class divisions among women. The poverty of women is an issue that gained notoriety in the late 1970s and early 1980s. I examine it in Chapter 9, The Feminization of Poverty, Myth or Reality, where I identify and criticize some problems stemming from the use of the categories of identity politics, such as gender and accounting for women's higher poverty rates compared to those of men. At the time I wrote it, in the mid-1980s, households headed by women were the fastest growing type of family structure in the United States. The poverty rate among these households was high. Suddenly, the increasing poverty of women and children became very visible, and the phrase feminization of poverty acquired prominence in the feminist literature and in public discourse. Given the disproportionate poverty rate among racial and ethnic minorities, a large proportion of poor single mothers were non-white. Though acknowledging the importance of racism, the functioning of the economy, and the place of women in the occupational structure as contributing factors to, to the feminization of poverty, feminists argue that gender was the main cause, because women's poverty had causes specific to women such as family responsibilities, low-paying low jobs, and dependency on men's economic support. Most women were just a man were just a man away from poverty. Is it correct to state that most women are just a man away from poverty? Yes, it is, but only as long as it is acknowledged that most women are propertyless, members of the working class, many of them depending for economic survival on a relationship with a male willing to share his income. To disregard class location, to consider it redundant to say that class causes poverty, and focus only on gender as the cause of women's poverty is to isolate women not only from their class, but, but also from history. There are no abstract women whose lives are shaped only or primarily by their gender. In the real world, women have a place in the class, socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic structures within capitalist social formations. In the addendum that follows chapter nine, I update, I update some of the poverty data and discuss recent research findings that point to the relationship between changes in the, in the economy, declining economic prospects for working class men 
and the rise of cohabiting relationships and out of wedlock births, which often place women at the risk of becoming single mothers, thus jeopardizing their ability to work full time and improve their economic prospects. The next three chapters have their origins in insights gathered from personal experiences, critically examined through the lens of Marxist theory. Having grown up in a context where paid domestic workers were taken for granted as a feature of most households except those of the very poor, it became clear to me that among the structural determinants of the development of the women's liberation movement in the U.S. and the importance given in feminist theory to the effects of the unequal division of labor in the home was the fact that most women in the United States, except the wealthy and the few with very good incomes, were entirely responsible for domestic labor, whether or not they also worked outside their homes. This situation created a real and important source of conflict between men and women within the home and imposed material constraints upon women's opportunities. Reflecting on the political and economic significance of domestic labor, I eventually wrote the first two chapters included in this section. In chapter 10, the dialectics of waged and unwaged work waged work, domestic labor, and household survival in the United States, I examine the relationship between proletarianization, the rise of, of wage-dependent households, the variable relationship between income levels and the ability of people to use various kinds of domestic labor to improve their quality of life, and the impact of these phenomena on the oppression of women. In the U.S., where most people depend on wages or salaries for economic survival, the lack of income entails the impossibility, exceptions notwithstanding, of relying on domestic labor as a potential source of income, and the erosion of people's ability to use domestic labor on their own behalf for the ordinary tasks of reproduction. The domination of production over reproduction is manifested in the subordination of unwaged labor to waged labor of useful labor to abstract labor in ways that vary by class and strata within classes. Domestic work is inherently contradictory. It can be a source of oppression for women who are full-time domestic workers for themselves and their families. It is a source of oppression for women who are paid to do other women's domestic chores. Sometimes domestic workers are doubly oppressed by the woman who pays for their services and by the company through which they are hired. However, as I also argue in chapter 11, loving alienation, the contradictions of domestic work, some areas of domestic work, childcare and cooking, for example, can be creative and enjoyable, the material basis for non-market, non-utilitarian caring forms of social relations, consciousness and experiences. As people undertake to do things together with family and friends, cooking, sharing meals and homemade preserves, gardening and sharing their crops, practicing or teaching each other crafts, playing musical instruments, etc. They do so in a free, self-actualizing manner, in a space free from market relations and calculations where people can envision and practice what it is like to relate to each other outside the competitive exchange mentality fostered by the experience of working and living in a context where everything has a price. Individuals on their own also appreciate the contrast between the experience of alienated labor in their place of work and the free exercise of their skills at home. Be it in the kitchen, baking bread in their gardens, baking bread in their gardens, workshops, tinkering and fixing things. Granted, domestic work has its tedious routine, never done dimensions, but it also has its creative aspects as a set of practices that have the potential to create an alienation-free space, a space for the experience of non-market relations where bonds of friendship and cooperation can flourish. This space is being eroded by the commodification of domestic labor and of the material conditions of reproduction, processes that will continue unabated as long as the pursuit of profit rather than social reproduction and the satisfaction of human needs is the central aim of economic activity. Chapter 12, Self-Sourcing, How Capitalism Gets Us to Work Without Pay, originated from my encountering computers for the first time in the mid-1980s and reflecting on their implications for the organization of work. Since then, the amount of unpaid labor that enters into paid work and into consumption processes has increased extraordinarily with the development of the internet and the online, 
and the online economy. Corporations reap enormous profits by intensifying the amount of unpaid labor done by consumers. Jobs are lost because people, particularly but not exclusively women, are increasingly doing more unpaid work, both online and offline, at work and at home. This form of unpaid labor is not gender specific. It is done by women and by men. It is not just women who can now complain of being oppressed by being forced to do unpaid labor. Chapter 13, From Social Reproduction to Capitalist Social Reproduction, is the result of exploring the extent to which my work might be considered a contribution to the literature on social reproduction theory. After a brief and critical examination of the literature, I concluded that my approach is different. Social reproduction theories emphasize the integrated nature of the processes of production and reproduction, and stress the dependence of, pro of production on the reproduction of labor power. At the highest level of, of abstraction, production presupposes reproduction and vice versa. Societal survival presupposes the production and reproduction of the means of production, the means of subsistence and the population in an integrated system. Historically, however, at the level of analysis of the capitalist mode of production in capitalist social formations, production determines reproduction. The social reproduction of the capitalist class in intermediate economically secure classes is assured. However, the social reproduction, i.e. the economic survival of the working classes, their access to their conditions of reproduction, is subordinate to changes in capital accumulation that constantly create a surplus population or reserve army of labor. Given that the economic survival of the vast majority of the population in capitalist social formations is dependent on wages or salaries, their social reproduction is subordinate to the ups and downs of the capitalist economy. Wither Feminism The chapters included in this section also deal with matters pertaining to social reproduction. I place them in this section because they also pose the question from different angles of the political relevance of feminism today or, to put it otherwise, of the future direction of feminism. Implicit in my answers is the idea that as the effects of globalization increase, the polarization of income and wealth ownership everywhere, and capital's efforts to reduce labor costs even further, result in declines in the demand for male labor. A feminism focused exclusively on the oppression of women, or on women's rights, is not likely to find followers at this time of crisis, when the employment of women is often accompanied by the unemployment of their fathers, sons, husbands, or life companions. At the very least, feminism needs to change focus, expanding its reach by narrowing its constituency to focus on working class women and on the problems afflicting, afflicting the, work, the working class as a whole. Underlying racial, ethnic, and other antagonisms, workers share, in the last instance, common interests, whereas racial and ethnic minorities are themselves divided by class. What benefits members of minority populations with higher incomes and in the capitalist class does not necessarily benefit the working class majority. In chapters 14 and 15, Connecting Marx and Fem Feminism in the Era of Globalization, a preliminary investigation, and global capitalism and women, I examine the effects of globalization on working women and on growing inequality. Global capitalism is the process of eroding the advantages the working classes in the advanced capitalist countries enjoyed in comparison to the rest of the world. In the US, the leveling process is harsher because of the inadequate safety net for the poor, near poor, and the unemployed. I also explore the relationship between the worldwide deepening of inequality caused by globalization, declines in the demand for male labor, increases in women's participation in the labor force, and changes in the relations of, produ of reproduction in poor and wealthy countries. As working class poverty increases and male employment opportunities decline in poor countries, women are forced to migrate looking for employment in advanced capitalist countries. Millions of women have become migrant workers and new phrases 
have entered the literature. Feminization of migration, feminization of the proletariat, and feminization of the labor force. These phenomena indicate that global capitalism is changing the relationships between men and women, and among women, both in Western and non-Western countries. In the process, it is creating a very complex terrain for feminist politics a terrain favorable to the resurgence of Marxist feminism. Chapter 16, Capitalism and the Oppression of Women, Marx Revisited, offers a systematic account of the Marxist feminist theory that underlies my writing about women. I revisit not only Marx, but also myself, having achieved greater clarity in the presentation of the key elements of the Marxist theory of the oppression of women I have sought to develop over the years. I argue that the relevance of Marx for understanding the capitalist basis of the oppression of women is to be found in his methodology. This guided my thinking in identifying the material base for the oppression of working class propertyless women in the articulation between production and reproduction, which subordinates the latter to the former. I also argued that in light of Marx's analysis of the limitations of civil rights and liberties, the oppression of propertyless women would continue as long as capitalism continued to be the dominant mode of production. Looking back. More than 40 years have passed since the publication of my first article, Marxism and, Fe and Feminism. Looking back at the chapters in this volume, I can see how their subject matter is related to the historical context in which they were originally written. In the mid-1980s, there is a shift in my work, from theory building to the critical examination of specific issues affecting women. And as the discourse on inequality became subtly changed into a discourse about cultural differences, diversity, and identity, I also wrote about the ways in which an exclusive focus on identities, be it gender, race, or ethnicity, is theoretically, methodologically, and politically counterproductive. In the last three chapters, I revisit and sum up my contribution to Marxist feminist theory, and inevitably, I look into the effects of globalization on women's lives. Is the theoretical analysis I developed in my earlier work still relevant? I believe so, because capitalism remains the dominant mode of production. The empirical effects of global capitalism, however, have altered the material conditions in which we live today, changing the organization of reproduction in some sectors, of the working class. The last few decades have seen vast ideological and economic changes. In the realm of ideology, strict social controls over sexuality gave way to the increased social acceptability of sex and childbearing outside marriage, same-sex relationships in marriage, and cohabitation among couples of all ages. The availability the availability of contraception and the, and the legalization of abortion in 1973, the cultural and political revolt in the 1960s against the Vietnam War and the strictures of the 1950s middle class morality, and the ideologies of the social movement, movements for civil rights. Women's and gay rights converged to result in dramatic changes in the sphere of personal life. These changes were and continue to be met by a conservative reaction that seeks to set back civil rights, especially voting rights, repeal the legalization of abortion, and curtail as much as possible women's ability to control their childbearing capacity. In the economic sphere, deindustrialization, downsizing, automation, and outsourcing in the United States accelerated after the fall of the Soviet Union as global capitalism engulfed the world. Income and wealth inequality deepened everywhere. In the U.S., the most unequal among all advanced capitalist countries, the result of these economic changes, which a politically defeated working class has been unable to restrain, has been the rise of the hourglass economy, or a polarized labor market. Relative to the demand for labor at the top and bottom of the occupational structure, there is a declining demand for labor in the middle of the labor market which has been hit the hardest by changes that have occurred in the American economy since 1970. These changes have affected male and female workers differently. The material conditions that place most working class men in a position of economic and social superiority over women are no longer widespread. 
Some men and women continue to pool incomes, but on different terms. Young working class women and men without a college education are less likely to marry. Women are likely to earn more than men and prefer to remain single or to enter into a cohabiting relationship when they become pregnant, sharing the economic costs of reproduction with men who are not financially responsible, and the last instance for the household economic survival. Most cases in which children are born to unmarried mothers happen to women in a cohabiting relationship. And in 2013, as it was during the last six consecutive years, 41% of all births were to unmarried women. Unmarried low-income men are also more likely to become single fathers, and if they have children with more than one woman, are unlikely to, to develop a stable relationship with all of their children, or to provide much economic support. Marriage requires a solid economic foundation, to the extent that working-class men's economic opportunities decline. The proportion of families headed by young women as well as the proportion of cohabiting couples raising children rises, while the marriage rate declines. Census, census data show that in 2013, married couples with children, no information is given about whether one or both adults work, comprised only 19% of all households, down from 40% in 1970. In the country as a whole, marriage has become out of reach for most Americans, except for college-educated workers who hold stable and well-paid jobs. College-educated women are far less likely to become single mothers, and when they marry, they will form dual-career families if they marry men with similar or greater earning potential and job stability. This is why the rise in non-marital childbearing has intensified socioeconomic status differences among women. It is unlikely that inequality and the education gap between working-class men and women will diminish in the near future. So the trend toward an inverse correlation between marriage and income is likely to intensify. As the earning potential of working class men decreases and more employment opportunities open up for women with and without a college education, women will enter and remain in the labor force even if their children are very young. Families in which men are the sole or main breadwinners have not disappeared but they are now most likely in the minority within the set of different reproductive contexts, i.e. families headed by single mothers below the poverty level, single mothers who are the sole breadwinner and live in relative poverty above the poverty level, single employed mothers involved in one or more cohabiting unions, married mothers who are also the main breadwinners, dual paycheck couples wherein the husband is the sole or main breadwinner, and dual career families, which are the most affluent and least likely to experience conflicts between work and family demands. In the context of these different forms that the mode of reproduction can take, working class women's divergent experiences of oppression unfold and labor power is reproduced. In light of these changes, I will address the question that I posed at the start of this section. Is the theoretical analysis I developed in my earlier work still relevant? I argue that it is. These changes support the historical materialist premise underlying my work. Under capitalism, changes at the level of production alter the mode of reproduction, i.e. the kinds of social relations within which the processes of physical and social maintenance and reproduction of labor power and of the social classes occur are largely dependent on the resources that the functioning of capitalism and the state of the class struggle eventually make available to the different classes. As far as the working class is concerned, reproduction is left largely to the working workers themselves, who manage as best they can under conditions they do not entirely control. Their survival strategy is open to female and male workers with different levels of training, skills, and resources. Strategies reflected in the different types of relations of reproduction found in a given social formation result from changes in capital accumulation, the opening and closing of opportunities for different sectors of the labor force, the state of the class struggle, and dominant ideologies about sex, procreation, gender, and so on. The families supported by a male breadwinner are represented less than 50% of all families even during the economic boom of post-war years, and its decline in the last 40 years accelerated after the 2008 recession. 
Married couples with children made up 42.9% of all family households in 1940, but only 20.2% in 2010. Most women do not live with or raise children today with a man who is also the sole or principal breadwinner. Just as it became important theoretically and politically to take into account class, race, and ethnic differences among women, so it is important to consider how different relations of reproduction affect the oppression of women. Furthermore, these different family arrangements suggest that the oppression of working class women cannot be fully understood in isolation from the economic exploitation and oppression of working class men. Men's lack of economic resources or earning, earnings lower than those of the women with whom they become involved do not keep them from forming attachments and eventually bringing children into the world, but will keep men and women from forming stable relationships within or outside marriage. What I wrote about the feminization of poverty in 1987 applies today to cohabiting families as well. Their increase is a real important, albeit partial dimension of a vast process, a social transformation resulting in a drastic de decline in the overall level of wages, fuck, a level of wages and the standard of living of the US working class. Since then, the prospects for the working class have worsened. From the standpoint of Marxist feminist theory then, and it, an exclusive focus on the oppression of women in general, or solely on the oppression of working class women, would neglect the relational nature of women's and men's lives and the extent to which their interests and that of their children, if any, are tied together. Marxist feminism can be of more than academic interest to the extent that it directs its theoretical and political analysis toward the oppression of the working class, keeping in mind that more than half of the working class is female, that the most disadvantaged members of the working class are women of racial and ethnic minorities, and that what is at stake at this time in history is not only a better life for women, but the maintenance and reproduction of the working class as a whole. Reflecting on the relevance of my work for understanding the oppression of women in today's context has led me to realize that my arguments tend to coalesce around the analysis of the oppression of working class women a tendency that culminates in the final chapters and is clearly expressed in the subtitle of chapter 15, From Feminist Politics to Working Class Women's Politics. In this light, I argue that from the standpoint of Marxist feminist theory, current changes in women's education, labor force participation, earning capacity, marriage patterns, and childbearing decisions, such that now many prefer to remain single mothers despite the hardship that such a choice entails, show that the socio-economic oppression of many working class women stems from capitalist macro level economic and political determinants. At the level of analysis of interpersonal relations, it is appropriate to consider the role of individual men in affecting the well-being, health and peace of mind of individual women and their children. At the macro level of analysis, however, changing economic and political processes can place working men and women in unequal locations placing some working class men in a position to establish relations of economic cooperation while often exerting economic power over the women they live with, married or unmarried. This possibility is withheld from others and in proportions that vary with the nature of the sectoral changes in the economy. In this context, the proportion of households headed by single mothers, alone or in cohabiting relationships, above and below the poverty level, is likely to continue to grow, thus increasing income inequality among working class women and increasing the growth through natural increase of a surplus population of a relatively unemployable, poorly educated sector of the working class. Given that the ability of married, college educated women to bear children, pursue their careers and enjoy the standard of, of living of dual career families is made possible, mainly not mainly but not exclusively by the labor of working class women, often immigrants or members of racial or ethnic minorities, what are the theoretical and political implications of, of the fact that it is not only men who oppress women? What are the long-term implications for working class women of declining job and earning prospects for working class men? How can we as Marxist feminists keep our focus on the issues that affect women 
and at the same time, place those issues in the context of the relentless impoverishment of the working class. In light of the variety of relations of reproduction within which working class women bear children and engage in domestic labor with and without a male partner, above or below the poverty level, in a secure or a fragile economic situation, it is clear that current processes of economic change have com complicated at the level of the social formation, the material conditions within which women experience oppression at home and at work. These and other questions call for Marxist feminist answers. A short time ago, I might have doubted that such answers might be forthcoming because I believed Marxist feminism had lost ground to other feminist perspectives. There are, however, reasons to expect a resurgence of Marxist feminist theory, research, and activism. Looking forward, I am not sure when I noticed, perhaps after the mid-1980s, that everyone seemed to have been suddenly swept away by the postmodern, post-structuralist turn. Socialist, radical, and Marxist feminisms receded into the intellectual practice and political activism of a small number of aging scholars, whose publications I stopped seeing in the book catalogs that publishers routinely sent to university professors. Although my work continued to be published, I believed that interest in Marxist feminist theory was limited to specialized venues and a tiny readership. I retired in 2007. Since then, until the last couple of years, I turned my attention to non-academic pursuits. The publication in 2010 of Eisenstein's Feminism Seduced, How Global Elites Use Women's Labor and Ideas to Exploit the World, reminded me that there were still scholars for whom it was not a contradiction to be both Marxist and feminist. When several years ago, Sebastian Budgen, the editor responsible for this volume, first asked me to edit a collection of my published work, I refused. I said that I was retired and did not think anyone would be interested in Marxist feminist work. He replied that, on the contrary, there was a lot of interest in Marxism and feminism, something I did not quite believe. Eventually, eventually I agreed to edit this book because of his persistence and because the publication of Brown's Marx on Gender and the Family, a critical study, and the reissue of Vogel's important Marxist feminist theoretical analysis, Marxism and the oppression of women toward a unitary theory, convinced me that there was still some interest in Marxism and feminism. That the interest is real and more widespread than I had imagined was recently confirmed. In 2014, I was invited to attend and participate in an international congress, the strength of critique trajectories of Marxism feminism. It turned out to be a very exciting and successful event that brought together a large number of feminists who, in one way or another, combined Marxism and feminism in their work. More importantly, it was most encouraging to see a fairly large number of scholars and students, many of them very young, intensely involved, who asked thoughtful questions and for whom the ideas the participants presented seemed to matter a great deal. The purpose of the Congress was to bring feminists together to identify pressing issues of feminist concern build on our energies and creativity, and establish new theoretical and political agendas. The topics presented and discussed ranged widely, from the classic feminist concerns with domestic labor and patriarchy, to identity politics and intersectionality, racism, colonialism, and the effects of neoliberalism and austerity politics in Europe and elsewhere. From critical ass assessments of the limits of liberal feminism co-opted by, ca by capitalism, to call to bring back into feminism the recognition of the importance of class. There were perhaps as many perspectives about the relationship between Marxism and feminism as there were participants. Some appear to give more emphasis to elements of Marxist theory, others to feminist theories, thus illustrating the possible self-identifications discussed at the very start of the Congress by one of the organizers. Am I a Marxist feminist? Am I a feminist Marxist? The goal of one of the Congress's organizers, the formation of a global union of Marxist feminists, might be considered utopian, but the principle that would cement this union, under no circumstances may the questions of life be subordinated to the drive for profit, expresses in a general, perhaps cryptic way, 
the Marxist and feminist critique of the many ways in which access to the material conditions for social reproduction, i.e. employment, food, housing, education, job training, health care, and so forth, is subordinate under capitalism to the pursuit of profits. What matters most at this time of deepening inequality and exploitation, when the success of a minority of upwardly mobile women stands in stark contrast to the difficult lives of most women, is the development of Marxist feminist perspectives that shed light on the material conditions that oppress women as the most oppressed members of the working classes, and as members of family or kin-like groups, i.e. as embedded in a network of relationships with children, parents, partners, and friends who need their care and support. I left the Congress no longer feeling intellectually isolated, and more importantly, knowing that this book will be a contribution to what I hope will be the coming together of Marxism and feminism in, a new, in new theoretical and political trajectories that reflect the vision of the younger generations in conjunction with the demands posed by the effects of global capitalism. If there is one message in this book, besides its potential significance as an instance of Marxist feminist theorizing, it is the political need to surmount the theoretical and political problems posed by the fragmentation of the political subject, an effect of the retreat from class, and the rise of identity politics. The key theoretical and political question is not, therefore, how class, in the Marxist sense, intersects with the various identities where individuals are presumably located, but how to differentiate between the effects of capitalist class power upon large and heterogeneous, in terms of identity, sectors of the working class, and the effects of identity-based interactions and conflicts within those sectors. In the absence of this distinction between levels of analysis, the effects of class tend to be perceived as the effects of identity. Wood, for example, argues that an important ideological effect of identity politics is to camouflage capitalism's tendency to create underclasses. When the least privileged sectors of the working class coincide with extra, econ extra economic identities, like gender or race, as they so often do, it may appear that the blame for the existence of these sectors lies with causes other than the necessary logic of the capitalist system. <clears throat> And that coincidence stems from the ease with which capitalism integrates and employs pre-capitalist power relations to create hierarchies of exploited and oppressed, digging trenches and raising barriers. I started to explore these issues in some of the chapters of this book. Hopefully others will continue the theoretical investigation and empirical research needed to elucidate the terrain where workers can unite across gender, race, ethnicity, and other differences. This should not be too difficult because, after all, most of the problems or demands that, if solved or attained, would make women's and members of racial ethnic minorities' lives easier are working class problems exacerbated these days by stagnant wages and intensified exploitation. For despite large increases in productivity, most of the gains have gone to capital. This book reflects my own intellectual trajectory from abstract theory building about the oppression of women to using theory to illuminate specific manifestations of oppression, a process that led to the realization that the focus of feminism itself had to change in a dialectical understanding that many working class women's problems are also the problems of the working class as a whole. Stepping back from my own work, I can see how, in the process of writing this introduction, my views about what I wrote have begun to change, and I have developed new understandings. Looking back and examining my arguments and conclusions in light of the changes that have occurred in the last four decades. Looking forward, I hope this book contributes, together with the works of other academics and activists in the U.S. and abroad, to the development of a new generation of feminists. Marxist feminists who are not afraid of the subtle political control inherent in the strictures against economic determinism and class reductionism and are willing to fully acknowledge the implications of the fact that, paraphrasing Marx, we make history but not under conditions chosen by ourselves. <laughs>